So, Erebus God of Darkness was uh, wanting me to do a video on the basic argument for quantum mind theory. Now, of course, there are several arguments, but in this video I just want to kind of go back to the basics and focus on the fundamental reason as to why the mind is quantum mechanical, and in particular explain why the self-collapse of the wave function is equivalent to consciousness, which is, you know, that's the Penrose Hameroff Orko R model. Or at least this is the uh, line of reasoning that led me to this conclusion. So back when I was about, I don't know, 14 or 15, I was thinking about the, the mind, and I realized, well, there really isn't any scientific theory that explains the mind. We have scientific theories for the brain with neuroscience and showing how different parts of the brain correspond to different aspects of consciousness and so forth, but there wasn't any actual science kind of explaining the nature of consciousness itself. You know, I could obviously see that you see greenness on the grass outside, and you look in your brain to see where that greenness is in your brain, or at least the brain process corresponding to it, and you realize that that brain process isn't the same thing as greenness in itself. And so this bugged me, you know, I, science was explaining everything else, I was a big fan of science when I was a little kid, and so then I was wondering though, why can't science explain the mind? And so I figured, well, there had to be some way to do this, right? And so I started with the primary evidence of consciousness. You know, we have free will, um, there's the binding problem you have to account for. That's why all the different sensory data or types of sensory data merge into a complete picture. You have the fact that you know conscious experience can't be broken down into anything that's also not conscious experience. You can't have a subjective state of love or hate and break that down to atoms. It's, it seems like a category error. So whatever consciousness was, it was fundamental. And then we also commonly think of the mind as observing something. And so we have all these pieces of evidence and, you know, the primary evidence of consciousness, and then we have to look out in science and see, well, what in science deals with all these same primary elements of consciousness? And the thing that stuck out like a sore thumb was quantum physics, right? You have indeterminacy, which that corresponds to free will. You have the idea of observation playing a role in the physical world. You have the fact that it's fundamental, and then you also have entanglement, which can help with the binding problem. And so from a purely heuristic point of view, I figured, well, the mind has to be quantum mechanical. You know, I, I didn't even realize there was something called philosophy of mind at this time. I was just a, you know, physics geek, 15-year-old physics geek, reading books at the library on quantum physics and relativity and so forth. So the, the whole notion of a lot of the you know, eliminativist ideas today seemed completely alien to me. I, when I saw those in college, finally, I'm like, where did these come from? This is completely bizarre. And so I figured, whatever consciousness is, it has to be naturally explained with physics. And in particular, quantum physics. And so being the naturally curious science nerd that I was, I figured I'm going to see if I can try and create an actual model of the mind from what I know about quantum mechanics. But at this point, I really didn't have much to go on other than general similarities between the primary data of consciousness and what I knew about quantum mechanics. But then I ran across a rather interesting thought experiment by the physicist Eugene Wigner called the Wigner's Friend Thought Experiment. And this gave me the only really direct link between the out-there empirical physical world and the in-here mental subjective world. So let me explain this experiment, and then I'll show you how this naturally leads to my quantum mind theory. I say my because I was, just remember, I was putting this all together by myself. I didn't actually hear about Penrose until a little bit later. And then I discovered that he had the same kind of ideas, and I'm like, well, this is cool. We have a, a scientist who's actually studying consciousness in itself, and so I eagerly got his book off some book catalog we had and started reading that. So anyway, back to the Wigner's Friend thought experiment. So the idea is that uh, Eugene Wigner is in his laboratory setting up the infamous Schrodinger's cat thought experiment. And he's putting the cat in the box along with the cyanide capsule, which is rigged to a piece of radioactive isotope, which decays based on a purely random quantum mechanical process. So now he shuts the box, leaving the uh, wave function of the cat and the radioactive isotope to evolve on its own, and so now the cat is in a quantum superposition of being both dead and alive at the same time. But there's a twist. He's bored of this experiment because he's done it before, and so he decides to go off to lunch instead and puts his lab assistant in charge of the experiment and then closes the door to his lab. And so then the lab assistant does the experiment while he's away at lunch. There's a little twist. He shut the door before he left, and so when he comes back, the cat was in the quantum superposition, but the problem is, is that everything within the laboratory is also a system in quantum superposition. 
So now his friend is in a quantum superposition of being sad after opening the box and finding a dead cat, and being happy after opening the box and finding a live cat. But the thing is, is from Wigner's perspective, his friend is, is in a quantum superposition of being both happy and sad from seeing a dead or alive cat at the same time. So this raises a rather interesting question as to when and where collapse exactly occurs. Does it occur when the friend opened the box to find the dead or alive cat, or does it occur when Wigner opened the door to his laboratory to find a happy or sad friend? And the only logical answer to this is that collapse is relative to the observer, right? So it doesn't make any sense to say that, you know, his friend wasn't really seeing anything before he opened the door. His friend actually did collapse the wave function of the cat with respect to himself, but then likewise Wigner collapsed the wave function of the interior of the laboratory with respect to Wigner. But then let's continue this on a little bit, all right? So you have Wigner seeing this with his eyes, except, well, you have wave function, you know, you have everything outside of his eyes is in a giant system as well, and so the wave function collapses with respect to his eyes, and then, of course, everything exterior to his skull is another quantum system, so everything in there is in superposition as well, and so well, at what point does this end, right? You have this whole chain of them, and at some point, this whole chain of wave function collapses has to terminate on the actual mind. And the only way to really get around this is to say that the mind doesn't exist, which I really can't say that, you know, I think, therefore, I am, or to posit some kind of substance dualism, in which case you say that the mind can't collapse the wave function because the mind is some other substance other than physical matter. And, of course, I never really liked substance dualism because that leads to interactionism problems which seem untenable. Now, I want to stress here that this does not mean that the whole world is subjective, as some people who misinterpret quantum mechanics want to say. Obviously, a unconscious photo detector or camera can finish the Schrodinger's cat experiment just as much as a conscious mind can. So that's all I'm saying here is that the mind can collapse the wave function in the same way that an unconscious piece of apparatus can collapse the wave function. There's nothing particularly special about the mind's ability to collapse the wave function, only that it is able to collapse the wave function just as much as everything else. And in addition to this, uh, just because the mind is able to collapse the wave function doesn't mean it can control what it observes when it does so, right? So it's not like the, the whole world is subjective to the mind. The, the probability amplitudes out there are still arranged in such a fashion that we see the same stuff every single time that we look out at the world and collapse the wave function. So this doesn't mean that the outside world is subjective or mind-dependent, as some people like to pretend, or, for that matter, it, it's not that it destroys objectivity either, as other people like to complain. So having cleared all that up, let's see what the wigner strand experiment actually does tell us. What it tells us is that, assuming substance dualism is false, that the non-mental process of measurement is ontologically identical to the conscious process of observation, in that they are both identical to the collapse of the wave function. And this is our link between the out there empirical world and the in here mental world. Collapse equals observation. And from that, we're just one short move away from demonstrating that self-collapse equals consciousness. Consciousness is by definition self-awareness or self-observation, and so if observation is ontologically identical to collapse, then it logically follows that self-observation, or consciousness, is ontologically identical to self-collapse. Ergo, self-collapsing wave functions are minds. Of course, Penrose had a different kind of approach. He argued that we have certain knowledge which is non-provable according to Gödel, and yet we somehow know it anyway, and so from that he deduced that it was fundamental, which correlated to the quantum scale. And I've since accepted these arguments as well, because they make so much sense. But this was my initial reason for believing that self-collapse equals consciousness. This is before I ever learned about Penrose's ORCOR model. So what's cool about this, actually, is that this argument holds even if some of the details of Penrose's model turn out to be wrong. Because the general principle behind it is still right. Even if it turned out that there was no knowledge that was you know, proven by Gödel's theorem to be non-computational, it would still be the case that self-collapse equals self-awareness. And of course it's possible that other little details of the model might be wrong as well. For example, I've always thought that Penrose's interpretation of collapse should be tweaked a little bit with our knowledge of entropic gravity now, but that's really more of a detail than anything. 
Now, if anyone's curious, uh, this model is actually compatible with other quantum mind ideas as well. Uh, for example, I was realizing that if you, know, you have self-collapse, well, another uh, quantum phenomenon that deals with collapse or is a uh, product of collapse is called the Zeno effect. And this, believe it or not, allows one to skew the quantum probabilities in the wave function. And so in this case, this actually gives you a very neat explanation for free will. And I actually have a video on this. I'll put it in the uh, description. But it turns out uh, there's a... didn't notice at the time there's a guy named Henry Stapp who had basically the same idea of figuring that the, the mind could exploit the Zeno effect to give us free will. And then there are other quantum mind theories as well, like uh, this was a notable one, is the holonomic mind theory, which is um, it's David Bohm and Carl Prebram's theory, and that basically says that the information in the brain is stored in sort of a uh, quantum Schrodinger wave hologram. Not too dissimilar from you know how the universe is supposedly set up, but instead it's happening in a brain instead. And this gives you a possible way to solve the binding problem, because now all the information in the brain is integrated into this single non-local field, and so you have an integrated experience rather than little parts of your experience, you know, the uh, spatial locality and the color qualia all jumbled together in a disorganized fashion. And from what I can tell, Orco R should be compatible with this as well. Now lastly, I'd like to address uh, something called the warm brain problem, which uh, critics of quantum mind theory have used as an argument against the idea that minds are quantum mechanical. The idea is that quantum effects only work when you're at a very tiny scale and when there's not a lot of thermal perturbations in the environment to mess with the quantum coherence. And so, therefore, since the brain is much larger relative to the quantum scale and much warmer, this is going to prevent any possibility for quantum effects having any significant play when it comes to consciousness. Well, the answer to this is that it turns out that it simply isn't so. I have this video of Penrose in the description, and at the end of it, he explains that they've actually found relatively warm quantum activity in carbon nanotubes. You see, the carbon nanotubes actually shield the environment on the inside from the excess warmth on the outside, and this allows for quantum effects to occur inside the nanotube. And, of course, microtubules in the brain are not structurally very dissimilar from carbon nanotubes, and so this raises the question as to whether you know, they could harness this kind of, or have, house this kind of quantum activity as well. In addition to this, they've uh, they have a new field that's emerging called quantum biology, in which they're discovering quantum effects actually playing a role in a variety of biological processes that they, they didn't think possible before because they thought they were too large and too warm for this to ever occur. Uh, there was one, I think it was last year, where they discovered that uh, quantum computing actually plays a role in plant photosynthesis. And they had another one, this was, they're not quite certain about this, but they're, it's a, a strong speculation that they were thinking that quantum entanglement may actually play a part in helping birds orient themselves when they migrate. And there's another one, this is also in the description, where they were discovering that uh, DNA molecules are actually held together by entanglement. So in this case, not only, you know, is it possible, but it's actually these quantum effects are actually needed for certain biological processes to take place. And lastly, and I'll end in this note, as of last October, it turns out that they've actually discovered topological qubits in microtubules now. It's just as you know, Hameroff was predicting. So is the warm brain a problem for quantum mind theory anymore? Well, based on what we now know, it doesn't look like it. That being the case, given that quantum mind theory can explain all the primary evidence of consciousness, and none of the other models can, that makes quantum mind theory the most viable candidate we have to explain the mind. And, well, uh, that's about it, so I'll see you guys later.